Welcome back, everyone. Um, here we transition from voting rights uh, to thinking about intergenerational spatial uh, inequality. Um, and I should note that we've had um, Dorian Warren was supposed to be here, sent me his slides. They were excellent. Um, but his father has fallen ill, so he's in Tennessee at the moment. So uh, we will hope to get him back up here for one of our other events. Um, but we are truly lucky to have um, a great group of folks um, on this panel, so, and a little bit more time for discussion. So thank you. Take it away, Jerry. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Gerald James. I'm a professor of economics and African American studies here at Yale. And I'm um, happy to be able to uh, hear some people talking about inequality and various matters related to that. Um, outside of economics. So I happen to be a um, regular participant member of a uh, seminar workshop on uh, the topic of capital formation and uh, financial markets and things like that, actually. But um, this will be something quite different. We won't, I won't, sure I won't be hearing anyone saying anything about Edo derivatives and <laughs> recursive equilibrium and things like that. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what our speakers have to say. And we're going to begin with Frederick Weary, who is a professor of sociology and the co-director of the Center for so Cultural Sociology here at Yale. And he's going to talk to us about from economic liberalism to economic justice, why conservatives get it wrong and liberals mess it up. <laughs> Which sounds about right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, so thanks again to Vesla for the invitation and also to uh, Jacob uh, Hacker who uh, reminds me that the 1971 birth year was in fact an excellent one. And, <laughs> And so um, what I'm going to do um, in the next 15 minutes or so is I'm going to uh, perhaps uh, uh, make a few people uncomfortable um, in the sense that I'm going to start out by talking about this quiet crisis of people who uh, don't have uh, bank accounts, who pay too much for whatever they do purchase, um, and who are really constrained in terms of access to credit and what the consequences of that are. And, one of the arguments I'm going to make um, is that one of the things that we find on the moderate and conservative side is a sense that economic freedom is um, uh, at least friendly toward or sometimes equivalent with uh, economic justice, and the evidence just does not support the claim. Uh, the other uh, uh, problem is that among um, well-meaning uh, progressives, there has generally been a tendency towards educating people financial literacy. So you educate them, you graduate them out of um, innovative uh, social programs, and they see this as a reasonable pathway to economic justice. But in this particular course of justice, very few can see salvation. And so part of what I really want to do is just, just start with the problem. Um, and when we look and see that about one in five um, black and Latino households are underbanked, which means that even though they have a bank account, they have used in the last year uh, what we call alternative financial services. So they've had to get the payday loan or, and those sorts of things that are really very costly. Um, and then we also see some pretty <coughs> frightening numbers for the percent who simply don't have a bank account. Oh, no, actually it's 30, I'm sorry, it's 33% who are underbanked and the 20% no bank account at all. Um, and sometimes when I present this as a problem, some people say, oh, you're, you're trying to push people into formal services, and, and uh, et cetera. And it's not about pushing them into formal services, but it's about trying to think about what the consequences are of not having those kinds of services. The other thing, too, is when we think about who lacks credit. And when people bring up issues of credit, it's not really that. I see eyes will glaze over very quickly in a general audience, and you have about Depending on who uh, does the numbers, some people have estimated it as high as 60 million um, adult Americans in the US who are not scorable. Uh, and so that means that if you went down from Florida through Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, 
and made your way up to the District of Columbia, and you took those populations, a lot of people. It's sort of a, it's as if an epidemic spread through a, this whole part of the U.S. and no one saw it. Um, and, and it's often seen as this lack of credit as a self-inflicted wound. So there's a sense that, you know, if they were trustworthy and if they didn't, you know, make mistakes that any educated person who can do simple math, but, that they wouldn't, uh, that they would actually have access. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and the other thing too is we'll also talk about what happens when you do have credit, but your family members do not. Uh, and so one of the things that we also see is the pressures to co-sign for loans, uh, the pressures to then get loans on behalf of family members, especially if it's a hardworking family member. And what you'll see, it's what we see in some of our ethnographic data is it was all well and good when this person had two or so jobs, because uh, the, the income flows are really volatile in a month. So it was, when they had the two jobs or so, everything was fine, hardworking. But then once you either get a, a, an illness, because you don't get paid when you're not working, um, if you're not like us. Uh, so once you get sick or one of those jobs disappears, that's when you have these family members who are then on the ropes. Um, it's especially uh, troubling when you see this happening for young uh, kids who are U.S. citizens, but their parents aren't, and so their parents need to use Social Security numbers to get utilities, et cetera. Anyway, so why is this a problem? So if someone told you that you want a house, you want a house, you both have steady employment, the house is $100,000, but you know what? You're going to just have to pay a lot more for that same house, and that house will appreciate in value at a slower rate. You would say injustice, but that is in fact what happens. If you are even looking for an apartment to rent, so we're not even talking about people who are well off enough to try to buy a house. You just want to rent an apartment. I don't know about the last time you tried to rent an apartment, but often now there's a credit check. They want to see your credit score. And so one of the things too, and so the, the person's name on the front slide, I should have said this earlier. Jose Quinones and I are doing a lot of work together. Uh, he's the executive director of Mission Asset Fund. And so when I get towards the end, I'm actually going to talk about some work they're doing and work we're doing together. But so, and this is a case that they, they encountered there's a Mission Asset Fund. You're trying to get a house, an apartment to rent. You don't have a credit score for whatever reason. Even though you can put down the deposit, you either can't get the apartment in the better neighborhood or you need to pay a lot more down for the deposit to get the apartment. And so you're basically paying a lot more for the same goods and services than other similarly situated citizens making similar amounts of money with similar levels of education. And sometimes when you're looking for a job, they're also looking towards your credit score to see if you are trustworthy. Uh, and so we then move from the situation of thinking about jobs and freedom to thinking about jobs, credit, and justice. Uh, and so here we're thinking about the people who may have the same employer, and they're doing everything else more or less the same, but it's just simply that one has a decent credit score and the other does not. And when you talk to people about what it means to have a decent credit score or not, you know, you hear lots of uh, stories about having a sense of dignity and things you have to do if you you know, care about your family. It's Easter, so what was I supposed to do? It's Christmas, so what was I supposed to do? I mean, you, you hear these stories. And when people think about budgeting and financial education, often you get this narrative of it's simple math. It's, it's arithmetic, right? And so one of the things I remember from the Democratic National Convention is when it was time to ridicule the Republican Party, Bill Clinton stood up and he said, but it's simple math. And in fact, often when people who are trying to access credit or who have had troubles with their credit in the past, they will tell you that same story. It's simple math. I should have known better. Therefore, you know, you, you're not gonna, you don't see this whole mass movement of people saying, the way I'm being scored is somehow unfair or the consequences of my score are somehow unfair because I did it to myself. It's a self-inflicted womb. I somehow lack virtue. And so here we see um, Jennifer Hawkshield in, in, in a Guineer 2004 piece talking about sort of this notion of 
individual effort. Virtue leads to success. Success is evidence of virtue. We return to Weber's Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. You are responsible for your own flaws. And so much of what you see is an emphasis on letting markets work. And the way we let markets work well is we say, make sure they're educated. This is something that both sides agree on. Get the financial education in there, remove legal barriers, clarify information, choice, choice, choice. Uh, and so there's, and therefore, a recognition that, OK, you're going to do better. There's still going to be a high uh, uh, inc like gap, because even if you're doing better, and the people who are doing better than you are doing better, and you're kind of increasing at the same time, OK, inequality is just what, you, it's just what we have to live with. But you're going to do better, mathematically speaking much better. Um, but what we don't do is we don't sort of try to figure out how people define their own needs and why they're selecting the strategies of action that they do. And so here again, economic freedom is not economic justice. But then what you also see, financial literacy. And so you know, when we hear literacy, who doesn't want to promote literacy? I mean, the general notion is knowledge is power is what we often hear. And sometimes I have to say there's a reason that the word knowledge is not the word power. <laughs> One of these is not like the other. Um, and, and so there are, the, and there are often these very rigid ideas about what it takes to be declared financially healthy, um, and a focus on teaching people how to manage numbers, and very little attention to the extent to which people are really managing relationships. And so we're, you don't see a whole lot of financial instruments out there that allow people to manage their relationships in the sense of ritual and social obligation uh, in, a, in a more res responsible, or at least something that can be read as responsible way. Then there's an emphasis on, you know, once you get your education, you need to graduate. You can sort of like graduate, get out, get out of my house. You're on your own. Um, and so you have these socially innovative programs. And what they'll do is they'll say, if people have participated in your program, why are they, st why are they still coming back for more of these, in this case, lending circles? Their credit score's up. They're doing much better. Why do they still want to do this? They graduated. OK. Um, so there's not an understanding about why people use the services that they use and what the other functions are of those services. And then there's also this other push on protection. And so one of the things that I will say is that, yes, we do need some protections. There's a lot of predation out there, predatory lenders, et cetera. What we also need is more competition for the kinds of borrowers that they target. And so what you'll see at the very end of my 15 minutes is uh, Senate Bill 896 in California, in which they, but without any ob objection, they said it got passed last August. Jerry Brown signed it in. Not a whole lot of fanfare, not a whole lot of coverage. And all it says is that if you are a nonprofit and you want to provide a loan of between, say, $500 and $2,500, which is that range where people are generally going to the payday lender, and you're going to provide a low, like a no interest loan with just a fee attached to it, you don't need to go through all the regulatory hoopla to do that you are now exempt from all, from all these finance codes, which is what the Mission SF Fund needed. They have been in close contact with Lou Correa uh, to get this done. They got it done, done very quietly and without opposition, because it looks and is market friendly. So there are, so on the, uh, at the same time that I'm saying we're messing things up, there are some things that we, in general, are getting right. Okay. And part of the way we get these things right is that we go looking for existing practices and beliefs and rituals. And we try to discover the informal advantage. So what are people already doing, but they're not getting credit for? Mission Asset Fund. So Jose Quinones, he, sa he says, you know, they, the people are always complaining about how do we know that this is a, a, a good bet for a loan? How do we know that they're, they're going to pay it back? Um, because they're not showing up in the credit system at all. Uh, but we do know that in our communities, there are lots of people who get together in groups of, say, 10 people, 
$100 in the pot every month. One person gets the lump sum of $1,000. It's informal, but everyone knows how it works. People are comfortable with it. And they are doing it even when they have access to formal banking services. So why don't we take practices that demonstrate your responsibility and credit worthiness and somehow formalize those practices? He got, Jose's kind of, he's, yeah, he's, he's great. Great and interesting because he believes in sort of partnerships and having collaborations with people that at, on fir at first glance you would say, oh, the, the ugly enemy, right? He went to the credit scoring agencies and Experian and TransUnion said, okay, we will let you report these repayments on loans as repayments on social loans. These people are now getting these positive dings on their credit report per month. And all they have to do is, oh, if they don't have a bank account, they have to open up a bank account, keep it open for at least six months, because all their uh, payments into the circle have to be done electronically. The lump sum has to come electronically. They also have to collaborate at the beginning of the circle, give their circle a name, talk to one another, talk about financial strategies, figure out that they are not idiots, and in fact, they actually know quite a lot about how to manage their money given their circumstances. And if you don't get the number that you want for the month that you draw your loan, because if you get it near the beginning, it feels like credit. Near the end, it feels like savings. You then have to appeal, have a conversation with the rest of the circle about why you should have your uh, number, your moment in which you collect the, the lump sum, moved up or pushed back. You are then given a lending instrument that resembles what you would see in a standard lending instrument so that you can figure out what are the things I need to look for, et cetera, and it's something that you're comfortable with. You're doing it anyway. So this was the, this was one of the innovations. And after 10 months, on average, they saw an increase in credit score of 168. They saw people's um, uh, overall debts go down. And so far over the last, I guess, three or four years, they've made about 3.7 million in loans. So they are, they are launched. Again, as they were doing this, they figured out we need regulatory clarity to keep the momentum going because they had other people who were interested in maybe doing this, but they said, we don't want to run a foul of the state. Regulatory clarity comes at 896. And then a pause. And so where the pause comes in is we have a social innovation that seems to be working, uh, but what we're also discovering is that the way people think about their financial needs is really different than what the nonprofits and the foundations are telling them that, about how they should be thinking about their money. And so how do we rethink needs? And how do we sort of assemble these into some kind of uh, structure in which we can think about how needs are being met both with government programs, private sector offerings, nonprofit offerings, so that we can bring together partners who on first glance really ought not even be in the same room and really shouldn't even consider themselves as being viable partners. We won't go through this thing because we're still working on our pyramid. Uh, and, and, and that is another, that's another challenge, another paper. And so I actually timed this for 12 minutes, and I think I'm right on it, 12 to 15. Yeah, see, every, yeah. Now, but yeah, every now and then I do something right. Well, you're growing it now. Oh, there you go. See, you see, there you, there, see, there you go. Okay, so, yeah, so, yeah, the victory lap came a little too early. I, that's not the first time I've done that. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, in conclusion, uh, so one of the things that, uh, that I just want to impress on all of us is that um, eh, the consequences for not having credit uh, and for not being able to link into a bank account are pretty severe. Uh, but these are consequences that, for the most part, people blame themselves and, and, and no one wants to talk about it. And they end up paying a shame premium. Uh, in order to evade shame. So much of what's happening is you're seeing a lot of stigma management strategies to evade shame and people paying a huge shame premium. Um, 
What we're also seeing, though, is that, and I didn't know that this was a thing, FinTech, financial technology companies out in the Bay Area are working very hard to try to think about how people are mixing and matching um, and trying to develop new, new financial tools to capture what they see is this new market um, that is somehow emerging. The other thing that we're seeing is that places like the Mission Asset Fund are also targeting that moment in life in which you are really coming into your own financially, college students. And so for the dreamers, so that with the, with the act to try to bring in, um, to try to defer, uh, what do they call it? Deferred action for college students. They have a special program for dreamers so that they get the application fee through the lending circle, but they get the check ahead, so everybody gets it at the very beginning of the lending circle, so that they are then routing them into healthier, culturally appropriate financial services and helping them find social support. So, so they are looking for a number of different ways of, uh, for thinking about what are existing practices that are culturally appropriate, that are legible in those communities, and how can they be adapted in order to, we're not going to get rid of, but we can somehow better address uh, economic inequality. So with that, I think. Okay, next, let's welcome Maya Wiley, counsel to New York's Mayor de Blasio, and advises him on policy and administrative matters, among other things, and civil and human rights and gender equity. So brave people who ask an attorney to speak for 12 minutes, but I, I will do my best. Uh, and of course, I'm not an academic, so I will try not to. I, so I was, I was saying to Pat, like I, I was so embarrassed that I was going to be on this panel with Pat, because usually what I do is I just cite his work copiously <laughs> and then look smarter to the public as a result. Um, so uh, OK, but at least. So at least I get to talk first, and I, maybe I'll cite his work and not say it's his, and then that'll be it. Um, so I, I actually thought I, I wanted to start, since it is Black History Month, with um, actually with two, sorry, I left it over here. Um, with two quotes from James Baldwin uh, that I wanted to use to frame what I'm going to say. One is that people are trapped in history, and history is trapped in them. Uh, and the second is, it's certain in any case that ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. Um, and the reason I link those two is because when we talk about inequality, I mean, first of all, there's the history, <laughs> the, the, the history being trapped in us, part of his quote, is really about how we don't even really understand inequality. I mean, so we use the term constantly, hi, Lonnie. Um, we use the term constantly, and we actually are always talking about different things, sometimes in the same conversation as if we're talking about the same thing. So if we really, you know, right now the convert, hi Kika, the understanding about inequality is, is, is generally based on income, right? And we're having this conversation about inequality as if there are really two groups who are unequal. One group is those who are the 1%, and then there's the other 99%. And that's kind of shaping, and, and, and it's come to a very race-neutral definition as well as a gender-neutral definition, and misunderstands that actually from a structural standpoint, we've just been hearing some of the examples of that, from a structural standpoint, we actually have multiple kinds of interactive inequalities, uh, and that it means that as a result, depending on who we are, where we are, where we live, we all may experience some form in that 99% of some form of inequality compared to someone else or some other group, but it could be vastly different whether we are a construction worker who is Irish Catholic living in New Jersey or whether we are a single uh, Latina mom who is undocumented living in Birmingham, Alabama, right? I mean, th those are not the same kind of inequalities even if they experience inequality. Um, but the history wrapping in us, we've kind of said, well, we're done with race because we have a black president, so we're good on that. Um, and that at the same time, what we really have to address is income. And sometimes we talk about wealth. More, more often we talk about income inequality. Uh, and that 
we actually rarely are willing to look at what's happening structurally, often that is historically produced, that has gotten us there. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the historical part because, first of all, most of you all already know it. Uh, but the, the relationship then to the second quote, which it is certain in any case that ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy of justice, is that we are also in a context in which power has become increasingly concentrated in private, private hands, corporate hands, where corporations are given and considered to be people, personhood, um, and in a context that then shapes our politics and our power at the same time, we have over the past 30 years, because of our success, has been demobilizing communities. So that's people, power, and then the policies that shape opportunity. So I, I'm saying all that as a backdrop because in 12 minutes I can't say all of what I mean by that. But Lonnie said it at lunch, so I don't have to. Um, which is that we have a series of policies that started, if we look at the first, just to summarize it so we all are, you know what I'm talking about which you do, which is in the first half of the 20th, in the, basically from the 1930s to the 1960s, we essentially created tons of policies that invested in people and created for the first time a middle class, but it was not a racially equal middle class. It discriminated in job category. It is sometimes explicitly discriminated. Sometimes ex it, it, it ha could just discriminate by virtue of the fact that it could just say, well, if you're a domestic worker or an agricultural worker, you don't get Social Security <coughs> benefits. So all of those things essentially created a middle class for the first time in this country, but that was not a, an equal middle class, right? And it did not look equal, um, and then created suburbanization. And so everything, all the inequalities we're looking, and in addition, and one fact that's very important, um, uh, particularly for legal historians, if you look at the 14th Amendment, which was one of the right, Civil War, War Amendment that its entire purpose essentially was to create citizenship for black Americans uh, uh, post-slavery. And if you look at Supreme Court case law, and this is the work of Professor Charles Black, what he found is that the vast majority of cases before the Supreme Court asserting First Amendment protections were asserted on the be behalf and to benefit corporations, not black people. Um, and I, so that's a really important thing to understand when we look at the fact that now so many Americans experience inequality in a context of, of private concentration of wealth and power, not just in a few people when we think about the 1%, but it's actually what the top tier of that 1% represents in terms of corporate power and corporate wealth. So fast forward to then why, uh, uh, what we, because so, I'm going to try to be positive, having just been really negative. Um, and, and I want to frame it a little bit in what that then looks like in current today um, context, because in New York City, when you're uh, in a city, which one is the largest city in the country, you knew that, right? But did you know that New York, because I actually didn't, I like, I knew it was big and I've been living in it for decades, but I actually didn't really think about the fact that not only is it the biggest and the most diverse, it actually is as large as the next three largest cities combined. So Los Angeles, Chicago, and Houston, if you put them all together, they get to be as big as New York. Um, which is an astounding thing when you think we are literally 8% of the, the metro area is the 8% of the country's gross domestic, domestic product. So when you're in a city government with a mayor who had, and actually a city council by and large, a majority of the city council says, we are committed to eradicating inequality in one of the most diverse cities, as well as the largest city in the country, thinking about the power of local government to start to think differently about how you dismantle inequality in a current context is actually potentially, and I'm not arrogant enough to say we're going to get there, but potentially a transformative moment not just for New York City but for the country. Um, and just to give you a little bit of sense of what, how much inequality despite numbers, right, because we all know where demographics are going, so there's this assumption in the conversation that if people of color are no longer in the numeric minority, then by definition the country will become more equitable. Um, and we know that's not true because we all have heard of a country called South Africa. But put that aside. Um, take New York City, right? And I just want to give you just a couple of examples because I think they're um, relatively shocking. Um, and I'm going to use gender because I think we, we often also erase 
what it means to be a woman of color and, and low income. But if you look at, for instance, 60% um, of low income mothers didn't have paid sick leave. Um, and the difference between having paid sick leave and not having paid sick leave, it can literally be whether you're feeding your family at the end of the month. I mean, quite literally. So putting aside whether you can amass savings of any kind. Uh, and most of those women are women of color because if you look at, we have something we, I, in my previous organization, we used to call Jim Crow jobs, which is we have racialized segmentation of the job market, right? So of the 30 fastest growing uh, job sectors in the country, it, they're actually very racialized. And six of those fastest growing job categories, like nurses' aides and home health aides, literally are predominantly over 50% women of color, and they pay less than poverty wages. So, um, and then in, if you add domestic violence on top of that, and I think this is really important as we're talking about public safety so often, 40% of all felony assaults in New York City and 33% of all rapes are domestic violence related. Uh, and if you look at about 24%, about a quarter of the city's population in our lowest income communities are 40% of our domestic violence cases in the city. Now that isn't because rich people don't beat their spouses, but it is because there are, in, in, there are built-in economic inequalities that also foster the conditions for domestic violence, right? Um, so I say all that just to frame it a little bit in, in real terms. Um, and if you look at our homeless population, we have literally constructed homelessness for women who are beaten because the solutions become that they have to leave home. And by and large, they're not exclusively, but when we're talking about low-income women, in New York City they are by and large women of color, but it also means the economic conditions for their families uh, including for those men, are often that they are unemployed uh, and also in very stark economic conditions. And as Pat's work shows, we actually see where we have communities that are extremely low income, traditionally, even for families that are at the top end of the wage categories in those communities, <coughs> their children experience downward mobility, economic mobility. So there are conditions of the community, not, and, and that's for a lot of the structural reasons that I've just Describe, but what can a city do about it? So I really wanted to frame my remarks about what a city can do about it because for one thing, we spend $70 billion a year. $70 billion. New York City spends $70 billion a year. So one question that we're examining is how can we utilize that money to ensure we're hiring women and minority-owned businesses every time we spend that money? Because we also know from the national studies that if you want to High, make sure that low-income people who are in high-poverty neighborhoods are hired. They're much more likely hi to be hired by uh, particularly minority-owned businesses. And literally something like 70% of the jobs in this nation are created by small businesses anyway. These are largely small businesses, um, comparatively speaking. So there are huge economic benefits not for individuals. And by the way, they tend to then have health benefits and all the other things that create the possibility of having assets. Um, they are actually, there's a multiplier effect, not just in terms of the business owners themselves, but in terms of the workforce. And then the community building that happens because of where that workforce tends to be located. And it's a good way to do it because the Supreme Court has also interpreted the privileges and immunities clause to say we can't say explicitly that you must hire locally if you are to get a city contract. Now, there are other things we can do to pipeline local workforce into jobs that we are creating, and we're doing that by first look programs where we're requiring contractors who are going to be hiring to first look at folks that are coming out of city-funded workforce development programs. It's not a requirement that they hire them, but it, it, it's another example of the city using its contracting power and that $70 billion leverage we have because there's, no there's no other way low-income people have that kind of capital leverage, right? But if government deploys it with low-income and highly impoverished and excluded communities in mind, we can potentially do something very different. And the other thing is obviously the policy itself. So bus rapid transit lines was one of the things that we're going to start doing to connect communities that have been disinvested in terms of public transit to get to job centers. Again, not a small thing, because if you look historically at policy decisions where we prioritized highway spending over public transit, yet the vast majority of people of color are not in cars, 
comparatively speaking, especially in a city like New York, but not even just New York, but we have not significantly invested in the public transit options for, for some of the communities that are also the lowest income, which is one of the reasons why they continue to be the lowest income. So to actually invest in the public transit lines that are going to connect them through bus rapid and to make it fast, right? Because for the vast, in this country, literally two-thirds of low-income people travel ni 90 minutes or more to get to a job. And that's because of where people have to live because of housing costs and where jobs are located and the lack of investment in the transit that connects them. You know, and then finally, I'll say, you know, in addition to obviously we're doing as much as we can on minimum wage and prevailing wage in New York City, we do not have the legal authority to unilaterally wa wa raise our city minimum wage where Albany has to do it. And uh, that's where power comes in because to have an administration that's actually closely allied not just to labor but to the progressive left generally politically means the kind of political organizing between citizens and their institutions and government around contesting with other parts and more powerful parts of government to do the right thing, which is part of why Governor Cuomo has now agreed to raise the minimum wage to $13 an hour when, he, when it was stagnating at nine, right? Uh, and that's as higher, actually, than what the president originally called for. That brings me to my last point, which is, at the end of the day, there's even cities, and even cities as powerful as New York, and one of the great things, oh, we're also going to prototype, by the way, child development accounts. So if, you, if children have as much as $500 in savings, for, they're like three times more likely to go to college than if they don't. So that asset problem in communities of color in particular is one of the things that also mirrors the, just on affordability, the access to education gap. So our, our, we are literally have <coughs> fundraised the money to ensure that we're going to pilot tens of thousands of kids in a three-year period getting child development accounts so that there's money there for college, which is going to help a lot of kids who otherwise will not have that. Now, none of this is sufficient. Uh, and I think that's a really important thing to admit. None of this is sufficient at dealing fully with inequality, but it does show the power of, of local government when it has will, and we have will not just in City Hall but in City Council, which creates a powerful block to do a lot, right, because we don't have a lot of opposition from our City Council. Sometimes they even can push us to do some stuff we might not be thinking about doing. Um, but it doesn't end the fact that we actually lack in this country a meaningful urban agenda. Uh, and if you think about it, the last time we really had any kind of meaningful urban agenda was the war on poverty, and that was fairly short-lived. Uh, and at the times that we have had the most progress in developing more equality is when we have had significant national attention and programs on attacking it and on supporting state and local governments as well as others to do it. So one of the things I will leave you with is at the end of the day, it's not just important whether New York City is doing the number of things I've said, which I think are actually excited and about and meaningful for low-income communities of color in particular, and will help everyone who's low-income. It's that if a city the size of New York does it and has an active allied relationship with advocates who are outside of city and state and federal government, and that other cities start to do the same things and develop out of it a set of demands and strategies that are both argued for by cities as well as by advocates and organized communities, we will actually have created an equation that could potentially demand the national urban agenda we need to actually address inequalities in all its forms. And that's the real opportunity we have right now. That is my hope, and that will help us eradicate the in ignorance that stands in the face of justice. Thank you. Okay, next let's welcome Patrick Sharkey, Associate Professor of Sociology at New York University. So I'm really honored to to follow Maya. Uh, it's been it's been remarkable to see what's going on in New York, um, and really inspiring and, and fun to hear about it uh, directly here. Um, so okay, so uh, um, let me get to it. The the uh, 
what I'll focus on kind of sits in between this panel and the next one. Um, I think I kind of decided to do it this way because I don't think you can really talk about racial inequality and some of the themes that I'll, that I'll talk about on uh, space as well uh, without bringing in a discussion of, of criminal justice policy and uh, uh, the carceral state, as Bachelor referred to it earlier. Um, so I, I'm going to make five points. I'm, I'm going to be very abrupt and, and we'll probably uh, breeze through some of the data that I'll show you, um, but I'll try to explain it. The, the punchline, even if I don't go through the graphs in detail. Uh, and the, the kind of basis for the entire talk is that when we think about racial inequality, we really have to think about it as organized in space, okay? So space, by space I mean cities and neighborhoods. Space has been the key way, not the only way, but uh, let me soften that a little bit. One of the major ways that racial inequality has been organized throughout the history of this country, and that's really been uh, true in other places in the world, but it's, it's particularly true in, in the U.S. context. Um, so I'll give some, just some, a little bit of data uh, to make this point and then, and then elaborate on where I think this takes us. And, and the comments about kind of the absence of an urban agenda is really kind of central to where I want to end up. Uh, That's why I let you thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, uh, so just at a basic descriptive level, um, making this point that racial inequality uh, is really uh, organized in space, organized along, space, along spatial lines. Um, you know, the first point is that black and white American children, and everything I'll say is black and white, and that's because um, a lot of what I'll say is uh, about multi-generational patterns. It's not because uh, every other group is... Uh, irrelevant, it's because I don't have the data to make the same kind of concrete claims that I can make about uh, African American and white uh, uh, families who have been in the U.S. for multiple generations, okay? So that's a limitation of the data source. Um, uh, black and white American children continue to live in entirely different social worlds. A shorthand version of this graph is that about two-thirds of African American kids uh, live in neighborhoods with at least 20% poverty compared to about 6% of, of white kids. Uh, this, this neighborhood inequality is multi-generational. Half of, of uh, uh, black American families who have been in the U.S. for multiple generations have lived in the poorest quarter of U.S. neighborhoods uh, for consecutive generations. Okay, so that's true for about 7% of white families. Uh, what this tells us is that when we look out um, in New Haven or New York or, or wherever we are, and we look at families that live in very disadvantaged neighborhoods, the disadvantage that we see, the inequality that we see, should be thought of as a continuation of inequality that's been ex experienced for at least two generations, okay? So a persistent experience of life in highly disadvantaged neighborhoods. Um, four out of five uh, black children who are being raised in high poverty neighborhoods are from families that have uh, lived in similarly poor neighborhoods for at least two generations, 80%, okay? Um, this has very little to do with income, okay? So this, this graph just um, looks at the average neighborhood conditions of uh, black, Hispanic, and white households, um, and this is a scale of neighborhood disadvantage, okay? So higher means worse, means uh, more concentrated disadvantage, unemployment, uh, welfare seat, joblessness, um, uh, these are, the, these are the, the features of neighborhoods that go into this scale, okay? And, and the one here is one standard deviation uh, above the average neighborhood um, in terms of disadvantage, okay? Uh, so, and then this is classified by income groups. So this is black, white, and Hispanic households making less than 30000 This is black, Hispanic, white all the way to families making $100,000 and above. So you can see the racial gradient, racial and ethnic gradient at each level of income, and then the comparison uh, that is, is usually surprises people is that if you look at black families making $100,000 or more, uh, they live in more disadvantaged neighborhoods than white families making less than $30,000 uh, per year. Okay, so this is the severity of, of racial inequality in neighborhood environments, and it really has very little to, to do with income. And this is a longer story about how to explain this. Um, 
which I don't have time for. Um, but we've actually made pretty good progress, I think, um, uh, explaining these, these patterns. Um, okay, the second claim, inequality is driven by conditions in majority black neighborhoods. So the distinction is, is in thinking about this as an individual or family or household level issue versus a neighborhood level issue. Um, this, this graph shows uh, the lighter shade is, is the percentage of um, uh, black American uh, families uh, living in census, in neighborhoods that are both disadvantaged and surrounded by spatially disadvantaged communities, okay? So in the heart of very disadvantaged sections of urban areas. Um, so if we look at black families, the, back in 1970, more than 70% of black families were in these very disadvantaged neighborhoods surrounded by disadvantaged, other disadvantaged neighborhoods. That has dropped, okay? There's been improvement. It's about 45% now. Okay, still massive racial inequalities if we look now, but there has been improvement over time. This is just whether the family lives uh, next to a, a track, a, a neighborhood that is intensely disadvantaged, okay? Uh, meaning more than two standard deviations above the national average. So think of these really high poverty concentrated joblessness areas. Um, that percentage has dropped from around just under 50% to, let's see, just about a quarter. Okay, so there has been progress in terms of where black American families live. There has been uh, no progress in terms of the conditions of black neighborhoods. Okay, these are majority black neighborhoods. These show the same figures. What do majority black neighborhoods look like in 1970? Well, about 85% were disadvantaged and surrounded by disadvantage. Over 60% were uh, shared a border with an intensely disadvantaged neighborhood. Uh, if we look now, the, the uh, percentages are, are about 82% and just over 60%. So no change in the condition of majority black neighborhoods. When there has been change, it has is, it is arisen from black families moving out of majority black neighborhoods. That has been the primary mechanism for advancement into uh, neighborhoods with less uh, uh, concentrated disadvantage, okay? Why did this happen? Well, this is, uh, my started to, to talk about this. Uh, in kind of thinking about this, I've drawn heavily on, on Beschel's work, um, and there's a more, uh, elaborate argument uh, in the book, but the shorthand version is, you know, if we go back to the war on poverty, if we go back to the late 1960s, there were kind of two narratives about the growing urban crisis, and that was a crisis of increasing joblessness, uh, rising crime, um, uh, social unrest, okay, the wave uh, uh, of riots that spread through uh, cities in the 1960s, growing pollution, all the problems that we associate with central cities really started to emerge in a major way in the 1960s. Um, uh, and there were two narratives for explaining this urban crisis. One was as a function that the crisis was a function of uh, persistent inequality and oppression, okay? Um, and I think that probably was the dominant narrative, uh, at least in legislative terms, for a good chunk of the 1960s. Um, the second narrative was that this was a function of uh, criminality and lawlessness um, and a lack of respect for so social order that was concentrated in urban ghettos, okay? And this was a very clear, and this is where Vesla's work has been uh, so helpful, just tracing the roots of that narrative of the urban crisis and the links that were made uh, very explicitly between life in central cities uh, uh, particularly in urban ghettos, uh, the connections to race and the connections to violent crime, okay? Those connections were made explicit in political rhetoric. Uh, they were made very explicit in the consciousness of Americans, okay? This was a time when uh, crime, violent crime started to be linked uh, with, with protests of all sorts, with the civil rights movement, um, uh, and with social unrest more, more generally. And this narrative has dominated urban policy since that point. I don't think that's an exaggeration to, to make that claim. That the solution, if this is the narrative of the urban crisis, the solution was the prison, okay? The solution was a policy of abandonment um, and punishment, okay? And 
since that, this is not the only legislative response, but this is the dominant legislative response since the late 1960s. This is our urban agenda uh, since the late 1960s, okay? Um, so again, that's, that's the bad news. The, um, this is the explanation for why, you know, when African Americans have made progress, it's by leaving those neighborhoods that are the object of, of abandonment and punishment as an urban <coughs> agenda, okay? Um, now, the, the positive development, and I think it's an enormously positive development, is that there has been a dramatic and sustained and very real decline of violent crime over the past 20 years. Um, this is measuring the violent crime rate. The peak there is in the early 1990s, but all this policy, this narrative about the urban crisis was happening in uh, the run-up from the 1960s through the early 1990s. This is what, what we know about urban poverty. What we know are kind of the dominant model of, of urban policy was, was developed in this period where violent crime was rising. This was connected to civil rights. This was connected to race in the central cities. Um, uh, this has reversed, okay? So violent crime has been cut in half. Uh, the murder, the homicide rate has been cut in half as well. Uh, it, data from long ago aren't great, but it may be the case that we're in the safest uh, period of our country's history, uh, at least measured by the homicide rate. Um, so this is a very real uh, development. The most violent cities have changed the most, okay? Led by New York uh, and Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, the drops in, so I should explain this a little bit. So this, this is just the, the homicide rate in 93 and the homicide rate in 2009. And uh, essentially, if, if there was no change in the rate uh, over this period, then, then the city would fall on the 45 degree line, okay? So all the cities on this side of the line indicate that crime has declined, okay? Um, so the fact that there are all these cities on the far right here that are far away from the 45 degree line means that the most violent places have changed the most, okay? The most violent neighborhoods have, have changed the most, okay? So this graph is just, this is St. Petersburg, Florida. Now, I show this because this pattern shows up in all the cities that we've been able to get data for an extended period of time, where there is a drop, there's usually a drop across the board um, in all types of neighborhoods. So this is the least violent set of neighborhoods back in, in 2000 in this case. This is the most violent set of neighborhoods. All groups of neighborhoods have had a drop in crime. The most, uh, uh, the sharpest drops have occurred in the most violent communities. And this is true. We, we looked at six cities. This is the first study that's been able to look at neighborhood level crime over an extended period of time. We looked at six cities. This is true in every one of these cities, okay? The largest drops in crime have occurred in the places that were most violent. Okay, what this means is that, or at least the way I'm interpreting this, is that the meaning of urban poverty has changed uh, in central cities, in the place, and not every city has experienced a drop in crime. You saw some cities that were on the 45 degree line. In the places where crime has dropped, the meaning of urban poverty has changed. Okay, very quick demonstration of this. This shows just the average rate of community violent crime for the poor population of the city and the non-poor population of the city. It's Chicago, Cleveland, Denver, Philadelphia, Seattle, St. Petersburg, Florida. Not a random sample. Those are the cities that we could get data from. Um, okay, this is at the start of the period. So we're tracking the change of violent crime over time. This is at the start of the period, the difference between the average community of the poor and the non-poor. This is at the end of the period, okay? So what this tells us is that there's been a convergence. Poor people continue to live in more violent neighborhoods, but there's been this real compression, this convergence of the experience of poor and non-poor people. This has been true uh, for racial and ethnic groups as well. So these, these uh, columns show uh, the average neighborhood conditions for whites, blacks, Hispanics in these six cities. Okay, this is at the start of the period. This is at the end of the period. Okay, so there's some, in Chicago, there's still huge racial inequality, okay? Racial inequality hasn't been overturned. Um, it hasn't been eliminated, uh, but it has been weakened. Um, in, uh, in Denver, there's no difference between the average communities of white, black, and Hispanic families. This is not adjusting for anything, okay? Um, just a remarkable change in what it means to be poor, what it means to be a member of 
uh, African American community, Hispanic community in these in these places where crime has dropped su substantially. Okay, um, so. Uh, what this means to me is that there is now space to imagine a new urban agenda. I think the connection between central cities, race, and violence, which was solidified in the early 1970s and became a dominant theme of American politics and American policy, uh, perhaps made solidified even more in the 1990s by Democrats. Okay, This is not a, a right-wing uh, model. This is this is the dominant model uh, of of um, urban policy for uh, since the the war on poverty since the early 1970s. Um, this connection has been weakened considerably. Okay, and I think what this does is it gives space to imagine a, a an urban policy agenda that will replace the prison as a primary tool to address uh, urban inequality. Um, the if I can say one last thing, the, the, um, how we do this, I think, is crucial right now. I think there is momentum from both the left and the right to confront mass incarceration. Um, probably more momentum on the right than the left right now, at least in terms of legislation, in terms of uh, um, uh, you know, potential uh, political actors. Uh, who will confront mass incarceration at the federal level, at least. Um, I think uh, progressives have uh, rightfully spent a tremendous amount of time arguing for decarceration. I think that effort has to shift to really focus on investment and integration, the kind of stuff that New York is doing, the kind of stuff that we heard about that's going on in, in Connecticut. That should be the really strategic. I'm not a political scientist, but I'm happy to be in the room with all of you who can tell me uh, if I'm wrong or not. But I really think this should be the primary emphasis of progressives, not to focus attention on decarceration, but to really focus on what's next, investment and, and integration. And I'll end there. All right, we have some time for some questions. I am absolutely thrilled to have uh, heard what everyone has to say, and I want to ask a question that maybe all of you have something to say about. I want to uh, link it to what Lonnie said in her question earlier in the early panel, and then maybe some of her comments um, during lunch. And so I guess I'm going to start with Patrick's point and sort of ask the question. I looked at all the data, and it's very compelling. But as being on my political scientist hat, I think of two things, and you may have an answer to this. I just wonder, as I looked at it, we know two things are true. I used to live in Los Angeles, and the downtown area, which nobody used to live in, I did, because it was close to work, and I liked living there, is now revitalized. But what's happening, hand in hand with that revitalization, is right, the influx of capital the outflux of people of color and poor people and you know the overlap of the two and i think of you know you can tell that same story in any number of other cities but i wonder and i try not to be too cynical about it is the renewed attention to an urban agenda in part spurred by or perhaps in service to capital coming in and not reaching these big questions that we're thinking about. So when you talked about all the shifting communities and the dropping crime, I mean, one way of looking at that is, you know, things have been made better because programs have been effective. Another way, and I don't know, you may have an answer to this, is people were just pushed out. So that, you know, the problems that they experienced, not that they're problem people, but people with problems, are just moved to a different location so that a conversation about an urban agenda may look differently because the people there are no longer, or the people that we are concerned about are no longer there in large part. I guess it leads to the last part and I'll shut up. Um, if our goal is integration, and this gets to Lonnie's point earlier, I wonder about the research that talks about those moments in neighborhoods that weren't integrated. They're fleeting, relatively speaking, right? They don't last long because it just takes one or two families that are white with capital to move out and it tips over and becomes you know, a lot of the things that we think are troubled about neighbors that aren't necessarily places where there's a lot of capital and 
you know, I'm sure there's a much more complex story than I just gave. But I do wonder if our goal is having an integrated city, a city that has capital, is that possible given our politics? So that was a lot, but I'm pleased to take any piece of that. Yeah, great question. So let me, let me just clarify, my use of the term integration, and I say this without explaining how I'm, how I'm using it, I mean it to specifically thinking about mass incarceration. So we have a huge population of people who are, are coming out of the prison or otherwise have been involved in the criminal justice system. I, when I talk about integration, I mean integrating that massive population back into communities. Um, and it's a small number of communities that are absorbing. So I, when I say integration and investment, <coughs> That's really what I meant, as opposed to kind of the traditional notion of racial integration uh, in, in neighborhoods. Um, I think, so A, I'll, uh, I'll say, you know, the, the changes in, in crime, I think, are real in the sense that it's not a population <laughs> shift. I, can, I think we can say that confidently. I think the, um, the other piece of your question is crucial. So the question of, are we just setting up neighborhoods that are comfortable for capital uh, again, and what are the implications of that? Um, it's certainly true. Um, when, when crime goes down, this, the stuff I'm doing now looks at all these other dimensions of urban life and how uh, whether crime, reductions in crime have a causal effect on these other dimensions of life, like voting, as we talked about earlier, but also like, <coughs> uh, families with children moving back into central cities from the suburbs. So, Spaces change in the way that we would predict when crime goes down, and this is wonderful. I mean, this is, this is tremendous news for people who like cities. Uh, city public spaces are, are uh, thriving when crime goes down for everyone in those communities. Now, there is this challenge about how to uh, allow the families that have been in those communities to remain there and to enjoy the, the uh, New public life that, uh, and I think Maya probably has much more grounded ideas about this than I do because we're she's not. been working on this. Mm -hmm. But I, I, well, so I think it's a really interesting conversation and important set of questions. I, I um, to kind of put it, pull it out of its uh, current. I mean, we we tend to think about these questions in relationship to what's happened in the past rather than to think about them in relationship to the massive shifts that are happening that we could take advantage of if we were to think differently. So I think the way you pose the question is interesting because it's sort of based on since it's <coughs> not, I mean, not I'm oversimplifying and being reductionist, um, but, but given we, we've seen fleeting and tipping integration in the past and the fact that urban policy from urban renewal to now the return of capital and actually pushing low-income people of color in particular out to the suburbs so that we'll become Paris, uh, means that we, uh, that we actually, th that integration may be the problem rather than thinking about the different opportunities to think about stable community, stable communities that look more like the world given some of the shifts. Now, let me give you a couple of examples of, I don't have the full answers, but I, I, I will say that an effective national urban agenda is not a list of discrete policy demands. Uh, and I think that's what we tend to, uh, including me sometimes, right, fall back into easily is what are the three specific policy things that if we won would change everything? Well, we have to have some wins. <laughs> um, but I think the mistake we make is thinking that the vision is that there's some specific policies that get won rather than thinking that what we're actually contesting for is a United States that's radically changing demographically and radically changing in terms of the challenges of everyone thriving, including the opportunity now is including the deep wealth divide and the fact that some of the fastest growing economic sectors are actually young people who want integration. I mean, this is, we have to really put some of our generational stuff aside right now. Tech sector, uh, is the fastest growing, I'm taking New York, but every other city in the country is trying to compete for tech sector jobs. There's a reason for that. It's because tech sector is not a sector, it's actually an, e an economic ecosystem. And for every tech sector job, you're creating three more jobs in the economy. And that the tech ecosystem actually tends to pay for the non-tech job, for the non-tech job more than the exact same non-tech job not in the tech sector. 
-hmm. which means if you actually think about what that, so which is why cities are now competing with one another to try to get that sector. But that sector, that sector is actually both politically more aligned with us and extremely interested in living in very diverse, urbane environments. And this is actually a shift in what is happening with where we see some capital growing. And I think one of the, one of the things we miss sometimes is um, because, it's, because it's in a different category, right? Tech sector, like, like I can barely use my multiple devices. But um, it's, and, it, and it's not just New York. And in fact, in fact, Silicon Valley, now remember New York is, I am getting on my hobby horse now, but New York is, <laughs> but, but racial justice groups miss this because we don't see it as race. And this fundamentally is race. If you think about what's happening right now, so Silicon Valley is the number one tech sector in the country, right? No surprise there, no one be surprised. New York is number two. Right now they're trying to figure out how to hold on to their diversity so they don't lose their tech sector. That is a major shift, but it's a, it, and the other thing we have to think about, it's not just an economic shift. That's a social and political shift. But we have to think about how we organize into that. And that means both how we organize thinking about our urban agenda and our policy demands, as well as how we think about what capital is ours, or how we take and deploy capital in ways that we can. And it, it's, it's even created some interesting opportunities, even sometimes with large corporations. Uh, after I said all that pillaring stuff about large corporations. Um, but there's stuff Google will do that Verizon never would. <laughs> okay, so we, 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 we have to think very, very differently, I think, um, not based on our experience of the past, but really looking at the actual transformational shifts that are happening now that we should be taking ownership of and figuring out how to own. Yeah, Google supporting lending circles, by the way. They're one of the many support. Right. But the other thing, too, that we sometimes and forget. And supported net neutrality. So, yeah, okay, and, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. like it's. But the other thing we often forget is that when you come out of prison and you're trying to get st stable housing and yes. you need to get put down a security deposit, That's right. That's right. You, you can't do it. Right. Um, and so they, so, so we really don't have financial instruments and practices for people who were formerly institutionalized, either in prison uh, the foster care system, et cetera, for them to then start more stable lives because every time they, st they try to get started, they just can't really do it. And so there are sort of some discussions about developing new types of lending circles for the formerly incarcerated as ways of getting them now scorable into a system so that they can do some of the same things that other people do. Um, so this is a, an ongoing challenge. Joe? Uh, thanks, Jerry. I've been extremely moved by, by this panel, and, and uh, I, I have a couple of things to say and then a question to ask. Uh, what I want to say is that I have just finished reading a book that I think is going to be, along with uh, The Wealth of Nations and Das Kapital, one of the most often mentioned and least read volumes <laughs> in history. I've just finished reading Piketty's capital in the 21st century. And I must say that it does have in its data set just a great deal of information by race and by ethnicity with regard to the economic condition of different categories of Americans. What shocks me uh, about this panel was uh, Professor Sharkey's comment, namely, Piketty shows that the United States of America has jumped way ahead of everybody else in terms of how rapidly we are making our society more unequal. We now lead the pack. The astonishing thing about it is that unlike what has been happening in Europe, where because inequality is growing there as well, unlike Europe, our inequality seems to be created by annual return to wages as opposed to capital. The reason for that, however, happens to be, if I may say so, it happens to be New York City, because this is the place in the United States where we are still creating these perfectly astonishing levels of return to work as opposed to capital. So we 
how would you explain, this is a question for you, how would you, ex how would you explain this drop in violent crime simultaneously with this astonishing growth in inequality in the country? Uh, I grew up in Chicago. My, my, and I grew up in a very marginal, sub-marginal, let's put it straight. I, I grew up in the slum. Uh, if, if the violence rate in Chicago has dropped, it's got to mean that there are, that, that something like what has happened in Manhattan is going on in Chicago, namely the centers of this city, which were once places where you had a lot of violent crime, are being gentrified, and therefore poor people who live there are leaving. And so I think it may be misleading that graph that shows this drop in violent crime, if the data is true of urban America and not just your six cities, then what it says to me, among other things, is that we desperately need an ideology that we've never had that would address the issue of inequality in ways that none of our political parties historically ever has. So, let me, let me handle the violent crime part. <laughs> the, other, the other part is, is uh, someone else else. Before you answer that, can yeah. we have a point of clarification sure. on the crime rates? Mm -hmm. Are those age adjusted per 100,000 or are they just per 100,000? They're not, those are not age adjusted. They're not age adjusted. Those are neighborhood level rates. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, but, you know, when you look at the crime stats. So uh, I'm trying to think of what the best, best one to make the case is. Um, it's your model is, you know, with complete respect is, is not right. Okay. So it is not that neighborhoods have gentrified and crime has gone down. What has happened is that crime has gone down among the most among the poorest Americans. The rate of victimization for the poorest Americans is lower than what it was for the richest Americans 20 years ago. Um, it has gone down in, you know, uh, I showed you um, uh, most among uh, uh, African American and Hispanic people, uh, both in terms of perpetrating crime and being the victim of crime. Um, it has gone uh, down the most in the most violent places and the poorest communities. I accept that. What is the reason for it? So the, there has never been a strong connection between uh, economic inequality and crime. There has not, despite what sociologists of the 1980s uh, passionately argued. There has never, crime in the 1960s, that was the last trough. Um, that that um, uh, period was when, you know, that, that was a, a point where you would have thought that crime would have been very high. It's very low, okay? Same in this last recession, crime went down, okay? So there's never been... at the national level, not at the local level, because obviously you just told us the opposite. Mm -hmm. You're saying economic inequality at the federal level and crime versus at the local level, because obviously there is association between... And well, there's also an association. economic there's inequality not... as opposed to, meaning divergence, as opposed to individual level economic... Right. Outcomes affect do absolutely affect. So, there's there's evidence that individual level um, economic need affects property crime. Right. Uh, there's an association between violent crime and poverty. Uh, that's undeniable. But but the the mechanism is is not it, to understand crime. One should not make the case that the need for uh, that that it's instrumental. Uh, in terms of economic interests, um, that is is wrong. So when we when we look at the crime drop of the last twenty years, and this is not settled, you know, but I I have a chapter on this in, in in the book I'm writing, which the argument that I've settled on is that a you know people will get very upset for me for saying this, but incarceration has reduced crime, okay, inefficiently, um, it, we are arresting you know way too many people to get the kind of drop in crime uh, that it's produced, but the most progressive uh, people studying this have, have argued that uh, the rise in incarceration 
has reduced crime by at least you know 10 to 25 percent. So that has been a contributing factor. Okay, the vast scale up in terms of uh, uh, police departments uh, and uh, and the improvement in police tactics, and there has been tremendous improvement, even though there's still you know, horrible uh, oppression. <coughs> Um, the improvement in police tactics, meaning use of data, meaning expansion of community-oriented uh, policing, has contributed to the crime drop. And the third factor, and this is where um, I think the story has not been told clearly enough, the third factor is that the communities that were hit hardest by violence in the 1990s organized on a large scale to control and confront violent crime in their own communities. And you see this anecdotally in a lot of the qualitative literature, but I just got a full database of nonprofits, and you look at nonprofits, and in the 1990s, there, there were very few anti-violence organizations at the local level in the 1980s, like in a couple hundred by the end of the 1980s. In the 1990s, it exploded. These were organizations sprouting up in the neighborhoods that were hit hardest. There was a mass movement to confront violent crime, and it was a serious problem. I mean. Very young kids were killing each other in a way that had never happened before, okay? There was a large-scale movement. Academics don't know about it because most academics don't live in the neighborhoods where it happened, including, obviously, myself. Um, there was a large-scale movement to control violent crime, okay? And I think that, combined with these other factors, which if we're being intellectually honest, we have to acknowledge that incarceration contributed. Uh, the in, uh, increase in, in federal uh, money for policing and state money for policing contributed, and the movement within the neighborhoods hit hardest uh, overwhelmed, that's my argument, that they came together to overwhelm the problem. So stop and frisk is a great thing. No, it's not. Stop and frisk. I walk down the street in New York trying to get a tax in New York, I can't get one off of that. I, I think stop and frisk is, is oppressive. Uh, well, act and actually the statistics show is having stopped stop and frisk, we've actually seen no increase in the crime rate, which actually demonstrates that stop and frisk is not. I think what's been effective is knowing exactly where crime is, is uh, uh, the times and the places where it is most prevalent through data and being able to target it. Now, the way it's been targeted, I'm, you know, I'm actively working uh, in New York um, on this issue, and I think everyone there acknowledges that the way it's, it has created, it is oppression. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. it has also led to a reduction in, in yeah, violence. Well, the man's a quality of life for the young black men, who are really powerful. I mean, many, many law-abiding young black men who just walked down the street in New York a couple years ago and you could be stopped and messed with, and college students slammed against the wall. You know, like, I know. And, 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 you know, and these are, these are, the only crime is just, being black and, 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 and living your life as a normal human being. I just had a comment which is related to the new urban policy and the celebration, or maybe it's just on of high technology. I mean, any it seems to me any urban agenda for the future has to deal with the competition between cities for sectors like high tech. Yeah which just strengthens the hand of high tech. I mean, they can, Google can do X, Y, or Z, but if it's extracting concessions from cities to That's track an urban Google. Agenda, right. it's, it's, I, mean, I would say it's antithetical to an urban agenda yes. to have zero-sum competition well, yeah, between know, cities. But it's always in the interest of cities to do that if they think they can win. But a national urban agenda is cities coming together to demand that the federal government create federal <laughs> programs that invest cities in people. Cities at the top so, of the urban agenda have to be willing to, to sort of give that up, right? Like New York has to be willing to give it up. So no, I, I actually think that's a false, I, I think that's a false dichotomy is, uh, I don't. I mean, in other words, I agree with you that there's too much, and I actually think it happens much more on the subsidy side than the. I mean, it's it, it's the subsidy side problem, right? I mean, the the truth is, New York people pay. Tech sector is not locating in New York because New York's such a great place for tech sector to locate for financial reasons. Tech sector is locating in New York uh, 
for all the reasons why New York is a really cool, great place to be for the tech sector. So it's actually being attracted to New York not for that reason. And uh, Michael Bloom, it's, cool it's cooler than Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley because that's, they're actually, and more global, and more global, because that's actually extremely important to the tech sectors to be global and to be in a global city. So I, I say that, and it's actually a particular segment of the tech sector, it's not all tech sector, right? So it's like, it's the apps, it's the, but the, my, I guess my point is I absolutely agree with you on the subsidy and taxation side, because, and 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 I think one of the reasons the cities that structural the cities do that is because there is no national urban agenda. Which so first of all, cities, for instance, New York, we can't unilaterally raise our tax rates. We have to go to Albany, which means you know, I mean, those kinds of structural conditions actually sets up and creates the conditions for the comp zero sum competition. Right. If you have an effective way. urban right. strategy, and it is part of the design of the urban no, strategy. No, my point was only that you have to have that in the urban strategy. Some kind of that's critical because otherwise yes. you're going to be in a situation where the power of corporations, which you sort of alluded to yeah. at the beginning, is only reinforced. Well, and, and the truth is cities can't do it alone. In fact, cities have to be held accountable, So, which is why I said, you know, it has to be it has to be a larger strategy than just saying if cities get together politically and do something together and the demand, it works. That's not, that's not the political science of it, right? It has, there has to be a, there has to be uh, there has to be a citizenry that's demanding an urban agenda, but where cities actually are an extremely good political leverage, because there are a lot of cities willing to align around some very aggressive stuff. And let, let me just give you one example that is not, uh, this is a, I am, I am throwing this out as a possibility, not a prediction, but one of the emerging movements out of the, out of, uh, the progressive left is for non-citizen voting. Now that is a political non-starter, but you know what? So is the abolition of slavery. So uh, I think the issue is if you actually think about those kinds of organizing strategies and demands, and by the way, there are cities I think over time that will start to think about passing that at city level if they're, if they're able to stay progressive. Just a few, but those few are really large. And once they've created some, possibly created some political cover on that, this is a scenario, not a, then actually what you do is you create so much more political power because if you look at the changing demographics and how much of the voting block is not engaged because it's undocumented, you actually have the potential to actually change what some of the demands are. And I think that's why it has to be, it has to be an aggressive non-governmental <laughs> strategy, but thinking about where there is leverage within what some local governments will be willing to do that becomes a synergistic uh, relationship, and that's all I'm suggesting. I'm not suggesting cities are the end-all, be-all. I'm not suggesting they are the silver bullet, and I'm certainly not suggesting that everyone should sit back in their seats because there's some progressive mayors in some large cities who will get it done. I mean, because, but I will say, and I, I say this in complete and utter honesty, that to be in a situation, we, we're meeting with Boston Mayor Walsh, we're meeting with um, Los Angeles Mayor Garcetti. That, I mean, when you meet with the, it, there is something different happening, in large part because of what's happening in the country politically because inequality is so damn bad, that it is created a different possibility of what large city mayors are willing to say and do that is more progressive and more aggressive than two years ago. And that's really my only point about the opportunity. And, and it's not on all things, but if it's on the right things, in conjunction with pe what people are demanding outside of cities, it really could produce something very different. Um, we are actually out of time. Well, we can go, I think, um, because we have a break till 3.30, I wouldn't actually mind getting a few more questions and going. Right. I'm sorry, dear. That's fine. Like getting a few more, a few more can we, can we all agree collectively that, um, that we maybe take, take five more minutes or, or seven more minutes of questions? Thanks so much. This is really fascinating. And uh, I've been hearing about the sort of network, the mayoral networks of mayors talking to other mayors of cities really interesting. But I was wondering, on that graph, actually, we've heard a lot of the great stuff about New York, but Cincinnati is the one yeah. that is the outlier, although the, the yeah. crime is relatively low, right? It has increased. So I was wondering, if we've heard about some of the strategies that New York has taken and is taking now, what, what is it that makes Cincinnati doing the opposite? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, Cincinnati is an outlier there in the sense that crime has gone up a little bit, at least in those years that I was looking at. Um, I think you know Cincinnati had this these very 
severe uh, uh, riots and racial tension uh, derived directly from police brutality cases. I think that was in the early 2000s. Uh, so I think that local history um, is, is anyone from Cincinnati here? Could speak to this? Um, uh, you know, I think, I think the issues that we're seeing now um, in New York and, and Ferguson and elsewhere uh, were happening in Cincinnati in the early 2000s on a, on a pretty severe scale. Um, so it, it might, you know, that's my only kind of uh, knowledge of what's going on in Cincinnati that would, that would speak to that. But it may just be that they have very tense and unproductive relationships between community and the police. I'm surprised to see you have Chicago as an outlet because I feel like I'm, I, and I didn't get to see the dates, the years that you included, because Chicago in the last three years had enormous crime rates. And, and I just wonder if, um, if uh, relative to the, you know, in the, in the short term they, they've had a spike, uh, relative to 1995, crime has been cut in half or so, yeah. Um, at least by the homicide rate, by the homicide. So Chicago has gotten much safer in terms of homicides. Chicago still has a very high crime rate, and Chicago probably has the most severe inequality uh, across neighborhoods, although even that has, has converged. There's, there was a blog post that got a lot of attention um, suggesting it hadn't, but um, uh, there was actually a correction by the, by the guy who wrote the, the blog post. He got the data wrong. Um, Chicago has had a convergence, uh, it, but still, I mean, this, the degree of inequality is very extreme. Yeah, yeah, I guess I'm aware of that degree of inequality, because if you look around where the University of Chicago is located in all of the suburban, you know, small suburban areas, and then you go downtown, Chicago is like you're in a different country. Mm -hmm. And so I was, that's why I'm surprised when you talk about the drop in crime rate, because when I, you know, well, I listen to the news, so, <laughs> you know, there's all this outrageous thing the last couple of years. I didn't know about magnifying. Yeah, but, I mean, the point you raise is a good one, that there, you know, we shouldn't be content with the level of violent crime. Violent crime is still incredibly concentrated in space, and there are communities, you know, where I could present this and, you know, get laughed out of the room because <laughs> they're still, yes. you know, very yeah. violent places. This may be a question for mine in particular, but maybe all of you have things to say about it. Um, in a policy prescription, to what extent, if anything, does the attention to the public school system have to do with this uh, equation? Uh, I can imagine their politics that are their own animal that you probably don't, you know, there are people that don't want to get into it at all. But it has to you be mean as a to topic, me. as a political, as a as a, as topic? a possible yeah. element of an urban yeah. agenda, but also a oh. part of the problem that one might see yeah. as linked to questions yeah. involving violence. And I mean, stuff. I, I, if you're yeah, no, no, I think to, I, it's yeah. it's hugely important. Um, I think the the I would actually argue for a variety of reasons that housing is more primary, uh, and I think that's for several reasons. Um, if you look at the two biggest. Uh, uh, expenses for, for, for people um, that become completely prohibitive for low-income people is housing and child care. Um, one aspect of that is we are dealing with, uh, in part, in part, which in the city, not nationally, uh, which is universal pre-K. And that's, that's, a, that's a partial because at least it takes care of, you know, six hours a day, you have hopefully a quality, I mean, we are pushing for a quality program, free and guaranteed seat for your four-year-old, right? So that, that actually is, takes care of a couple of years of the child care gap potentially for people. So there, there really is a, an economic benefit that, as well as an educational benefit. Um, ha, the reason I say housing is because, first of all, there's such a link between what happens in schools based on housing and, and that one of the problems we actually see very little national discussion or traction on is housing. Because when we talk about gentrification, why people are pushed out as capital is coming back into cities, it's housing. And it's housing policy and it's housing cost. So you, if you have public housing authorities, which, and, I mean, this isn't just New York. This was New Orleans. This, was, uh, this is a lot of cities where now when capital starts to come back, some of the only ways that guarantee people's ability to continue to afford the neighborhood are those in subsidized housing, those are, those are in public housing. 
uh, except that we've been disinvesting in public housing for two decades. So actually most housing authorities are in the red, which then creates a situation in which cities are thinking about how they privatize their public housing stock. So unless you actually have a very aggressive strategy on talking about how you create and subsidize housing so that there's housing affordability, particularly as capital is returning, you're just, we're not going to have an effective urban strategy, but it also enables us to connect housing to also how we do schools, right, because there's such, a, there's such an interconnection between housing and schools, L less so for a city like New York, but New York's an outlier on that. What, what is more complicated in the conversation on education is charters. Mm -hmm. and, and it's complicated uh, for all the reasons we all know, right, which is a, a large constituency in communities that for some of us who may argue against charters uh, because of the way we fear its impact on public education, some of the very people who are impacted by that argue for charters. And there's a lot of division and it's, it's not, there's not an obvious race class division here. There are lots of low-income people of color who want charters and there are lots of folks who don't. Uh, so it's a high, there are highly contested issues about what an urban education agenda looks like. Once you take investment in it out of the equation, I think there's a lot of consistency around investing in it and we need to put more money in it, but not what the it is. <laughs> um, so, so I, yes, the short answer is definitely yes. Um, but I think given the, some of the complexities around how divided we are, we are actually less divided around housing and particularly given the subprime crisis and a, a range of other issues around affordability that it may be, it may be one of the entry point policy areas to, in order to get it at education more effectively. Uh, one of the things that I was struck by when you, Patrick, were talking and also uh, you know, about this possibility for a new urban agenda, which is like incredibly exciting. But then I was thinking back to Keith's map about 70% of the states being dominated by the Republican Party. And we also keep in mind that the Republican Party now has within it a movement, the Tea Party, which um, is, um, I mean, people sort of go back and forth on this, but there's no way around the fact that it's very racially inflected. And, um, that was polite. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, and so, um, so that would seem to stand in the way of the new urban agenda. And I'm just wondering, like, what that mean? In other words, you're finishing up this book that says, we're at an historical um, juncture where opportunities are opening up, and then you're telling us that in New York City we're actually pioneering a model using New York's unique advantages and, and the exceptionalism of New York to, that can create a portable model. And so I was just wondering, between the two of you, and it sounds like you also do talk to each other. Um, <laughs> I just follow him on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Who would not? <laughs> no one who's smart. Yes. So what are you doing? Well, I, so I, th this is a really important question. So first, I, I actually, um, I, the Tea Party movement itself is a deeply complex movement, and yes. it's not a monolith. Uh, and I think that's important because while it was wildly successful, I think we've also seen cleavages within it, uh, and a tendency then to think about it as being bigger than what the it might be, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's a core that is, and it's actually the very ideological and racist core, and then there are a whole bunch of folks who identified with it uh, but for a variety of different reasons. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I say that is that what it, we, did, we did one overlay comparison at my former organization um, after, after the recession where we, where we mapped, it, just because data was available because mm -hmm. some great group did some great stuff and we could overlay subprime and race on top of it. Mm -hmm. But what we found is in, is in districts that, w that were Democratic, that flipped to Republican, because of Tea Party, right, the, the Tea Party organizing, um, that those places had really high, uh, were hard hit by the subprime mortgage, mortgage crisis. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in there were actually places that didn't flip, same demographics, same demographics, but didn't flip Tea Party. And the mm -hmm. reason, and the, and the correlation, I mean, we can't say it was the reason, but the correlation was we, they were not hard hit by the subprime crisis, um, which actually was, this isn't like perfect social science, but it, but, but it actually did speak to something that, that many of us believed, which is the amount of energy that's beyond that core, that hard core of the Tea Party is, was about economic insecurity mm -hmm. and the way it can be manipulated by race uh, and the context. 
the reason I say that though is we did not contest hard. I mean, we've been demobilizing communities in a lot of ways for a lot of reasons. So I think your question is really important because, not because the Tea Party is, in, is infallible and because we can't beat it. Yeah. It's important because what it really points us to is the fact that our institutions of organizing and mobilizing have been deeply weakened. Uh, and are deeply fragmented. I mean, both the which, what's happening in the union movement being the most obvious, but it's not exclusively the union movement. But I think one of the hopes is that we've also seen an increase in organizing in low-income communities of color at the same time that we've... So part of what we're seeing is the opportunity to start to bridge where we have had traditional labor organizing that has so often been so important to winning electorally and, and pushing policy because they're large and have money and then they can spend. Um, with the fact that this non-unionized and vastly fast-growing population that tends to be low-income communities of color are now being organized and trying to find partnership with unions. So I actually think where it points our attention to is how do we actually rebuild uh, uh, the apparatus on the left that is multiracial, that is multi-issue, multi right, that's not fragmented by issue, that is demanding that, because that's really what the Tea Party represented. That's really what, it, put, the, put aside the multiracial, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's what the Tea Party represented, right? Which was multi-issue, but it organized around the principle of no taxes. Uh, we need an organizing principle, but we also need an organizing apparatus. Although, as the culturalists on the panel, mm -hmm. I just want us to be very careful not to sort of go too deterministic from the, because there may, so, yes, no, yeah, we, there's so much yeah. we don't know about the characteristics of those demographically similar neighborhoods sure. where you do have the subprime versus yeah. where you don't have it. Yeah. And the other thing we don't know, too, is what, what is the experience of inequality, mm -hmm. right? So the, one of the difficulties is we, we have all these metrics about why, why we think as academics that inequality is so awful. Mm -hmm. um, but what we really don't know is the varied ex experiences and how they cluster um, mm -hmm. in communities that have very similar financial uh, fundamentals, um, and sure. and that's and so. I just want us to be a little, yeah. you know. This is you being an academic and me being an on the ground. So I mean, because no, I think <laughs> no, 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 but, but yeah, this yeah, is no, on the ground. No, 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 no. I promise you. I promise you. These people are on the no, ground. No, I'm not saying you're not. I'm saying what I'm saying is the care. No, no. I, it's, a ta it's, a, it's a strategy issue. Yes, yes. Because yes. The, the question is, what do you have to know before you try? That's really my point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I think one of the one of the things that happens in the debate between and this is multi generational because I remember my parents having this fight with some right which is where we say we think we know enough about what we need to experiment and try in terms of cleavage and, and organizing opportunity versus what we can what is knowable um, based on the research we can amass around it so I think what ha that's where that's it's it's a healthy disconnect right it's a healthy tension not disconnect that's the wrong word it's a healthy tension. <laughs> Um, and uh, because one of the things that I think has started and is starting to change a little bit, um, and I say this having come out of the wonk world, um, <laughs> so believe me, it's, it's, it's that um, so much, if, as, particularly if we look at where we've seen successful social movements, so much of it has just been, oh hell, let's just go try this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because we see things happen, we're mm -hmm. strategic and formed, like we see uh, what we think are opportunities, and we're just going to now try to lean into this. That's all I really mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the research behind it, though, is really, really important. Just like this, I mean, everything in this conversation about what the research tells us and doesn't tell us is also really important because it's how we kind of mine the educated guess. Yes, but the social innovations we study are, it's, that's, how, it, that's how researchers lean in. And so yeah, we sort of look for these opportunities yeah. of, oh, this lending circle yeah. innovation. So yeah, we absolutely. lean in that way. That's absolutely. And so, 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 we, so, we, so we're closer, yeah. So we're actually closer. Then we sound. Uh, <laughs> there needs to be a lot more of the use in that week okay, okay. because I promise you that there are a lot of academic circles. Where oh yes, that's oh, not oh yes, and, and, I've, and I've seen the. Yeah, and I, and that's, I mean, yes, and, no, and I say yes. that because I think you're absolutely right, mm -hmm. and a lot of what we need is for academia to be more applied in the way it does mm -hmm. research, and that would also be a tremendous leverage point yes. for development mm -hmm. strategy. It's more the Dane and not the use around. Yes. That's, yes. that's the problem. So I will take the last word with a caution. <laughs> <laughs> and that is that we keep in mind that um, for a lot of us left thinking people, inequality is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. 
But typically for people in the United States, inequality is not a bad thing. Why inequality is gaining in traction right, right. now is because of two things. We have growing inequality <clears throat> combined with tremendous stagnation in the middle part of the distribution. And then I might add real devastation in about the bottom quarter of the earnings distribution. So we've got inequality of the worst possible kind, rich getting richer, and the middle and poor deteriorating. And what we want to keep in mind is that our first objective has to be to try to think of policy alternatives to help the second part of that, not inequality per se. Now, that pro mm -hmm. those policy alternatives will, of course, attack inequality, but we have to keep our eyes on the real prize. Mm -hmm. So we're finished for this. <laughs> <laughs>